Welcome to this week's edition of Ask an MS Expert. I'm John Strum, and I'm the host of the Real Talk MS podcast. Each week, Real Talk MS reaches thousands of people in more than 90 countries around the world with the news that people affected by MS need to know. I'm also a non-scientist member of the International Progressive MS Alliance Scientific Steering Committee. I'm a district activist leader for the National MS Society, and I chair the Society's California Government Relations Advisory Committee. My wife, Jean, lived with Progressive MS for 23 years, so I've had a front row seat experiencing all the ways that MS can impact a family. I'm thrilled to be with you today. I see that people are continuing to join our webcast, so let's give them just another few seconds, and then we'll get started. Thank you to all of you who are joining us on GoToWebinar, Facebook Live, and YouTube Live. The MS Society's Ask an MS Expert webcast is designed to connect you with MS experts who are ready to answer your questions on the topics that impact people affected by MS every day. So as I chat with our experts today, please feel free to post your questions on Facebook and YouTube or type them into the question box if you're using Go to webinar. We'll try to answer as many of your questions as we can during the Q&A portion of today's program. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank today's program sponsor, Janssen. Support from MS Community Partners helps a society reach their goal of providing up-to-date information and support through programs like Ask an MS Expert. Fatigue affects about 80% of the people living with MS making it the most common MS symptom. Many people say that fatigue is one of their worst symptoms because it can interfere with their ability to function at home and at work, and it's one of the primary causes of early departure from the workforce. But there are things you can do to improve the way that you feel and minimize the impact of fatigue on your life. To help us better understand MS-related fatigue and share strategies for assessing and managing fatigue, we're talking with two experts today. Dr. Bardia Norbach is an assistant professor of neurology at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. His current research interest is focused on identifying new pathophysiologic mechanisms and therapeutic targets for multiple sclerosis fatigue. We'll also be joined by Dr. Kathy Zakowski, the senior director of patient management, care, and rehabilitation research at the National MS Society. Dr. Zakowski brings to our conversation 25 years of MS clinical experience and 15 years spent investigating the mechanisms of underlying sensory motor impairments and disability resulting from damage to the central nervous system. Thank you both, both for being with us today. MS is a complex disease that ideally requires a comprehensive approach to achieve the best possible outcomes. That means a person living with MS will work with multiple healthcare providers from different disciplines. Most of us are familiar with the neurologist's role in managing MS, but some people might be less familiar with how rehabilitation therapists can help someone with MS enhance their quality of life. So Dr. Zakowski, I'd like to welcome you, and I'm hoping you'll get our conversation started by explaining some of the rehabilitation strategies that are most important for optimal MS management and how those strategies might be connected to managing MS-related fatigue. Hi, thank you, John. Thank you for um, inviting me to be here. I'm excited to share with you some information that I know about fatigue, and I hope it's um, new information or helpful to the listeners. So you asked about rehabilitation, so very close to my heart. Um, lots of years of experience working with people um, with different um, diseases, including MS. But you know, rehabilitation is really a very broad field. So it's, the focus is really to optimize physical and cognitive function and quality of life. Now this means, this includes prevention, restoration, compensatory behaviors, and even maintenance. So all of that would, could, could be um, important for someone living with MS. Um, so there's a, a big variety of professionals. I kind of, I made up a list um, off the top of my head, but um, I think there might be others too. Um, I would start with 
um, within a rehabilitation clinic, there's generally occupational therapy, physical therapy, and speech therapy. So I thought I would start with those. So OT is a profession where we want to work on personal goals, adapting activities as needed, addressing cognitive issues, um, allowing you to, um, to live the life that you want to live. Physical therapy is more focused on strengthening and activity goals, so trying to um, address um, uh, uh, physical wellness, I guess is what I would say. Speech therapy, um, speech therapists work on feeding issues, swallowing, um, articulation problems. Um, there are others too, including psychologists, very important part of the team. They work on psychological well-being, including emotional and cognitive issues. Uh, there are also vocational counselors. These uh, individuals are trained to help you develop skills and abilities to participate in your vocation or your job or your career. Um, as, and as things change with a disease status, these people become very important in trying to identify um, gaps and um, alleviating barriers. There's also um, another direction would be respiratory therapy. So I know um, with MS, there can be acute and chronic respiratory failure. Um, and so these individuals really can help with um, addressing breathing control and weakness of your respiratory muscles. So, you know, the reality is that um, a fatigue really affects so many aspects of a person's life that addressing other symptoms um, may help your fatigue. And so all of those professionals that I just mentioned can help address symptoms of MS and many of them contribute to fatigue. So I, I guess that's how I would wrap it all up as how all these people are important. Dr. Norbach, I invite you to join us and I'm hoping you can tell us what MS fatigue is. In other words, how is it different from non-MS fatigue and, and what causes it? Um, thank you, John, for having me. I'm uh, really excited to talk about this most common symptom of MS. And as you mentioned, one of the most disabling uh, symptoms that we encounter in the clinic. Uh, so, uh, first step, again, as you mentioned, probably uh, would be defining what fatigue is and how we define fatigue and not to uh, confuse it with many other uh, related symptoms. So, uh, actually, a panel that was commissioned by National MS Society many years ago defined fatigue as a subjective lack of physical or mental energy that is perceived by a patient or an individual or their caregiver and that uh, perception of lack of energy affects their daily life, their uh, personal life, their professional life. So um, unfortunately, it's not very different from regular normal fatigue that uh, healthy persons uh, feel uh, during uh, you know their their day. However, uh, there are a few characteristics uh, specific for MS fatigue. So it's more severe. It's uh, uh, happening almost you know every day. Um, it is not necessarily related to the uh, activities that the patient uh, did. For example. Uh, even before starting any activity, just waking up in the morning, the patient may feel that they, they don't have any energy, they don't feel having any energy to uh, start uh, their physical or cognitive tasks. Uh, so maybe the severity, the pervasiveness of, of fatigue, uh, and the fact that it really affects uh, function and quality of life, that uh, may somehow differentiate from uh, normal tiredness or normal fatigue. Uh, there are a few other symptoms that quite overlap with fatigue. For example, uh, one symptom that we do not talk about uh, in, in MS clinics is excessive daytime sleepiness. So the fact that many patients actually have a tendency to fall asleep during the day, during, you know, they are watching a movie at home and they doze off very easily or they are in a car uh, in the passenger seat and after a few minutes of uh being the car riding car they easily doze off or even more extreme they might be a driver you know uh, uh stopping behind the red uh, red light and then dozing off um, so this is excessive daytime sleepiness that is more commonly known in the sleep disorders like 
obstructive sleep apnea or narcolepsy. But in fact, a uh, large proportion of patients with MS uh, have excessive daytime sleepiness that somehow overlap with fatigue, but with fatigue, but I would like to separate that somehow, and we, we may talk about that further. Another symptom uh, that is extremely common in MS uh, and extremely common, commonly ha happening with fatigue is depression. Low mood and depression, as you know, is a very common uh, symptom or comorbidity uh, of MS. And in fact, it goes hand in hand with, uh, with fatigue. It doesn't mean that every patient who feels fatigue is also depressed or down, but, but uh, there is a big overlap. So uh, many patients who have symptoms of depression or low mood, they, they're also uh, complaining from fatigue. Um, so uh, it's important to know how we define fatigue and important to know what are the other conditions that may look like fatigue or go hand in hand in, uh, with fatigue, basically. Anne Marie wrote to us and said she was diagnosed with MS six years ago, and she's been lucky, experiencing very few problems from her MS. She's now 34 years old, and she's maintaining what sounds like a very busy household with two children, the youngest of whom is two years old, a husband, and a dog. Since the time of her diagnosis, Anne Marie's life has moved along pretty smoothly, she says, except now she's feeling exhausted. She says she's getting tired so quickly and can't seem to bounce back the way she used to. Anne Marie wants to know if her exhaustion could be related to her multiple sclerosis or perhaps something else. So Dr. Zakowski, where would you start in assessing Anne Marie's fatigue? Yeah, I think I would start with a conversation. So I would want to, um, first of all, I guess, validate that this fatigue perception is very specific, you know, unique to MS, and that there are there are things we can do to address it. But we need to understand more um, from an occupational therapy perspective how it's affecting her life and her life's activities. Um, so I would also I would impress upon her some of the information that Dr. Norbach just explained that depression or depressed mood and fatigue are very closely related, that anxiety and fatigue are closely related, and that even just our thoughts and beliefs about fatigue can affect how, how our fatigue. Um, uh, the other thing that I would try to differentiate for, for, for us would be there are different um, some subtypes of fatigue. And this has been written about a little bit more recently, and I found it very helpful clinically. So there's physical fatigue. That's that lack of energy, kind of feeling weak or feeling physically drained. Is that what the fatigue is like for her? Or is it more mental fatigue? You know, that lack of energy to think, this idea of brain fog. Um, my, you know, my brain kind of wants to shut down kind of feeling. Or is it kind of a social emotional fatigue where you're kind of feeling emotionally overwhelmed or kind of, people describe it as empty or burned out or just defeated. So if we can address where the fatigue might be coming from, then we can, maybe we can direct um, interventions towards that area. There are, there are assessments um, that are specific to fatigue. They're primarily what we call patient reported outcomes. So there are questions we would ask people. Um, and uh, these questions have been, I guess, vetted and found to be really related to fatigue. And there's two assessments I thought I would mention. One is called the Modified Fatigue Impact Scale. And that measures um, the, the impact that fatigue has on a patient's daily life. And it's divided into three different areas, um, physical, cognitive, and psychosocial subscales. Kind of getting at what I was explaining before, that there's these three different areas that, that you know, fatigue might be affecting differently in each person. Another assessment that's commonly used is the fatigue severity scale. This one's um, often used as a screening tool. It's a little bit more brief, um, but it um, will identify common features of fatigue in MS. So, um, and last, I guess, what I would do is really discuss goals with her. So what, you know, what is her prioritized goals? To, what would you like to get out of this? What is the biggest problem with her fatigue in her life? And so in that way, as an OT, I can try to address my interventions to, uh, to fixing or addressing those specific goals. Dr. Norbach, I'll ask you the same question. If Anne-Marie was a patient in your clinic, where would you start your assessment and what fatigue management strategies would you discuss with Anne-Marie? 
Sure. Uh, as Kathy mentioned, first of all, I want to make sure this is what uh, what what she meant from exhaustion is actually what we talked about fatigue. So uh, I want to make sure this is like uh, this is not muscle weakness. You know, as you know, muscle weakness is a very common issue and symptom in MS. And I want to make sure uh, this is what she is describing. You know, with further questioning and neurological examination, this is not what she's referring to as exhaustion. Uh, after that, if if I think that this is really this fatigue is the subjective lack of energy that she's describing, uh, there are a few things that I want to address first. One is medications uh, that we commonly use for symptom management in MS. For example, uh, spasticity uh, is a common sim uh, symptom in MS, and we use medication to address that. Bladder dysfunction. Uh, urgency, bladder urgency is a very common symptom in MS. We use several types of medication to address that. Uh, tingling, numbness, nerve pain is also a common symptom of MS. And we also uh, do use different types of medications uh, for addressing those. All these types of medication can affect fatigue severity. So uh, that would be kind of a low hanging fruit, reviewing her medication, making sure that she is not on anything uh, that can worsen this, this, this symptom. Or if she's on, if I can uh, change the dose or reduce the dose, or if she's on a medication that for a symptom that has already resolved, uh, if I can stop the medication, that's uh, kind of a low hanging fruit to address. The other thing that uh, I would do is making sure that she doesn't have what we call secondary causes of fatigue. You know, the uh, type of fatigue that is not necessarily caused by MS. Uh, for example, that would be making sure uh, other conditions that may happen commonly with MS. For example, thyroid issues, hypothyroidism, or Hashimoto thyroid problem uh, is, is a common issue among, you know, uh, general population that can happen to patients who have MS. Uh, so, and, and um, hypothyroidism is famous for causing fatigue that's a very easy blood work I can check for. The other issue that I've uh, come across in the clinic is anemia. Um, not a small uh, proportion of my patients have uh, anemia without them knowing. And again, it's a very uh, easy uh, blood work to do and make sure uh, something like anemia is not contributing uh, to the problem. Uh, another uh, secondary cause of uh, fatigue would be sleep problems. Um, sleep problems, again, very common among general population, among patients with MS, uh, including, for example, obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, it's a you know, underdiagnosed condition uh, in the population. I, I would like to screen patients with a few questions and even uh, perhaps even center for sleep study if I think that that might be an issue or uh, other issues that can disrupt the sleep. For example, again, uh, going back to the bladder problems uh, that are common in MS. And if a patient has bladder problem, waking her up multiple times during the night and disrupts her sleep, so that, uh, that can affect the quality of sleep that can affect uh, her energy level in the morning. So that, those are uh, basically low-hanging foods, making sure they are addressed before, before getting to the uh, primary MS fatigue, the, the, the fatigue that is kind of inherent to MS. Well, following up on, on what you just had to say, doctor, we've also heard from Yvonne, who wants to know about the impact sleep can have on fatigue, and more importantly, what type of healthcare professional should she see to assess those sleep habits? Dr. Zakowski, I'd, I'd like to ask you to weigh in on, on the role that poor sleep quality can play in MS fatigue and which healthcare professional or professionals would be best suited to help Yvonne assess her sleep habits. Right, you know, just as Dr. Norbach mentioned that, you know, sleep quality is, um, is really is also associated with depression and we know depression is related to fatigue so kind of i would want to explain that relationship with her and make sure we explore how that might be affecting her um, the other thing that i think might be important would be to talk about basic sleep etiquette issues 
um, things that don't seem like rocket science but could have a big impact. Um, so the idea of no caffeine in the afternoon, for example, or um, not you know limiting use of devices when you're in bed, or um, and just understanding how alcohol can affect sleep, that kind of thing. Um, in terms of professionals, I mean, I think definitely mentioning this to your neurologist would be very important. Um, also, I think um, occupational therapists and psychologists uh, could um, address um, issues with sleep using interventions like mindfulness or relaxation techniques. These are things that um, would require at least an evaluation with someone, but could also but could be done at home um, and and at times when you're um, getting ready or wanting to go to sleep. So in this in this way, it could affect your sleep quality. Jackie wrote to us and asked if it's possible her disease modifying therapy is causing her fatigue. Dr. Norbach, you mentioned that some medications that are used to manage other MS symptoms can cause fatigue. What about disease modifying therapies? Is it also possible for a DMT to cause fatigue? Uh, very good question. However, it's a really difficult question to answer. Uh, unlike major uh, MS symptoms such as relapses or uh, new lesions on the MRI that are studied really well uh, in the setting of disease modifying therapies, basically they are the main outcomes that uh, we look at when we, when we study disease modifying therapies. Unfortunately, um, MS symptoms such as fatigue or depression or cognitive dysfunction, they are not uh, studied as extensively or uh, with the same degree of uh, attention as those other issues like relapses or MRI changes in the setting of disease modifying therapies. So uh, our knowledge about the effect of disease modifying therapies on fatigue uh, is, not, is not extensive and mostly lower quality uh, studies. You know, the highest quality of studies for medications are called randomized controlled trials. Uh, on the other hand, lower quality studies called uh, observational studies uh, that we cannot rely on the results as good as randomized controlled trials, but those uh, studies are the, 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 the ones have, uh, which have looked at the effect of disease modifying therapies on symptoms such as fatigue. So, uh, and the results are conflicting. So there are some disease modifying therapies, uh, some observational studies mentioned that may actually improve fatigue in MS. Uh, for example, natalizumab or tysabri, there are uh, several observational studies. Again, as I said, we have to take those results with a grain of salt. They, they mentioned natalizumab or tysabri may improve uh, fatigue uh, in patients with MS. Some other observational studies mentioned that some other disease modifying therapies such as interferons may uh, in fact worsen fatigue. Again, as I said, because we do not have high quality randomized controlled trials in those regards, um, I cannot tell you with high degree of certainty how DMTs affect fatigue, uh, but uh, I think mostly medications that we use for other symptoms, they are more likely to affect fatigue. For example, medication that we use for treatment of bladder dysfunction, for nerve pain, or for spasticity, they seem to uh, have a more pronounced effect of, on fatigue rather than the DMTs. Let's talk about how MS fatigue can be managed. Dr. Norbach, thinking back to Anne-Marie's question, or, or just thinking about fatigue management in general, how is MS-related fatigue treated? Very good. Uh, so very difficult question to answer again, because uh, the amount of studies that have been done and the quality of the studies that have been done and that are being done for disease modifying therapy is usually at an, another level uh, as compared to the studies that we have for uh, treatment of MS symptoms. So uh, basically the evidence for any type of uh, treatment of symptoms such as fatigue, uh, the quality of evidence is not as high as uh, what we have for disease modifying therapy. But again, we have to work with what we have available. 
Um, so again, first step after we talked about ruling out secondary causes of fatigue, medications, depression, sleep problems, uh, anemia, and thyroid problem, and we, we address all those things uh, or we rule out all those issues, we think that what the patient is describing is the primary MS fatigue. So there is no other cause or all other causes are addressed. What to do with this situation? So um, there are a few modalities of treatment that we have been using in, in clinic for the primary MS fatigue. And I start with what has the strongest evidence for, for helping fatigue. And those are uh, one, number one, exercise. So uh, we will talk more hopefully later that it may sound counterintuitive uh, that we are talking about lack of energy to do physical activity. And now we're asking patients to, to exercise uh, for treatment of fatigue. It sounds counterintuitive, but there are many studies in fact have been done in this, uh, in this condition. And they all, almost invariably, recently I, I, I reviewed several of them, uh, have shown that uh, different types of exercise, aerobic exercise, stretching, uh, strengthening exercise can in fact improve fatigue. Okay, so that's perhaps, uh, again, a low hanging fruit, uh, something that we really have evidence for, uh, for, for it working, and it has many other uh, benefits aside from fatigue, okay? So even we, we think it may have uh, beneficial effects on cognition, beneficial effects on disability even in MS. So um, that would be uh, number one recommendation. Again, we will talk about uh, the caveats and the issues. Uh, the second modality that has a lot of uh, evidence supporting uh, its anti-fatigue effect is cognitive behavioral therapy. This is some sort of uh, therapy, psychotherapy, that can be administered by our psychology colleagues, our rehabilitation colleagues. Uh, there are even apparently online uh, cognitive behavioral therapy uh, modules available. And uh, that's usually um, administered, as I said, by our uh, rehabilitation colleagues and multiple, multiple studies, including a study that reviews all other studies we call meta-analysis. Uh, they have shown that cognitive behavior therapy has a positive role in management of fatigue in MS. Last, and, and actually the least perhaps, uh, are medications. So as a neurologist, probably the easiest thing for me is prescribing medications. You know, uh, writing a prescription is the easiest thing that I can do. But I have to really look at the evidence, whether this medication that I prescribe, do they really work? And if their side effects, if their adverse events uh, outweigh their benefits or not. So we do use different various types of medications commonly in the clinic. Uh, many of you may have heard about amantadine, modafinil, or provigil, uh, or modafinil, or neovigil, methylphenidate, or, or ritalin, and multiple ritalin-like medications like Adderall, Vyvanse. We use them very commonly. We prescribe them very commonly in the clinic because it's easy. However, if you look at the literature, if you look at the studies that have been done, uh, the results have been uh, very conflicting. Most of them actually negative uh, about uh, the, whether these medications work or not. And uh, the review of the studies that we call meta-analysis, looking at these uh, uh, medications, they have recommended actually, they couldn't conclude if these medications work or not. They, they recommended doing better studies. So in fact, uh, my colleagues and I recently completed uh, a large study of multiple uh, medication we use for fatigue, specifically for amantadine, for provigil, and ritalin. And we showed that, true, they all improve fatigue in, in uh, patients with MS, but they improve fatigue the same amount as a sugar pill, in fact. So we, we, we used the, all this medication in the study in conjunction with the sugar pill, or what we call placebo, or, which is an inner substan substance, and 
we showed all of them uh, affect the fatigue severity the same amount as sugar pill. So they do not work better than sugar pill. And unfortunately, they had more adverse events like anxiety, like uh, sleep disruption, like headaches, more than the sugar pill. So after doing that study, I've been um, you know, more skeptical about using medications that we commonly use right now in the clinic for, for MS fatigue. So hopefully, hopefully we can find a group of patients who are who can benefit from this medication without having much side effects, but indiscriminate use or routine, routine use of medications is something that I cannot recommend that to 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 my colleagues and to to many patients. Dr. Zakowski, I think Dr. Norbach got us started going down this path, but I'd like to ask you about some fatigue management strategies that are used by rehabilitation professionals. Yes, I think um, Dr. Norbach did a great job of explaining um, or starting, uh, sort of emphasizing the importance of the studies that support these different interventions. So um, I, I agree. Um, I will start with I, a, a list that I think starts with the studies or the interventions that are the most supported by studies. And then there are interventions that don't have a lot of studies but also because it's not a medication really has very, you have very little to lose by trying it. So I still mentioned some of those. So exercise, you know, I, I guess my policy has been, you know, some exercise is better than nothing. Um, you do want to limit overheating um, and, and you could explore the use of cooling garments to, to address that. Um, you could, uh, I know, you know, the idea is someone says they're fatigued and, and my response is, well, why don't you exercise? It sounds counterintuitive, right? Um, but there are ways to exercise um, differently that might that might be more useful. Things like um, reducing the energy costs of of walking. So maybe you can do exercise that doesn't include walking, or you can do walking. Um, you can walk as exercise, but use a cane or use a walker just for the exercise portion, just so that you can increase your heart rate, um, but you're not um, putting yourself at risk of falls, and you're not you're not inducing more fatigue. Another type of exercise that I think is worth mentioning is um, studies that are looking at intermittent training. So training where you do um, higher um, intensity for very short periods of time, like one minute or two minutes. Um, and then you have a break right after that. And so that might be another way that someone who is um, very fatigued and is struggling to exercise because of that might be able to um, exert um, the benefits of exercise. Um, I, I also agree that cognitive behavioral therapy is really, really very important. You know, and this, just to give a little caveat about it, it really teaches people how to recognize and change negative thinking um, that may contribute to fatigue and disability. Um, there are new studies looking at um, the importance of maladaptive thoughts, which are, from my understanding, um, those thoughts that are kind of catastrophizing or excessive worry, um, those can really affect your fatigue. I think that goes into the box of sort of that emotional um, fatigue that I mentioned earlier. And so cognitive behavioral therapy can really address that. And there are um, several good studies um, showing benefits from cognitive behavioral therapy. These studies are very expensive and hard to do and really track over a long period of time. So I guess I want to put the caveat in that we are studying this. Um, but but we're still a long way from knowing the ideal intervention. And, and other interventions that I, I don't want to forget because I think they're um, relevant and something people can try at home would be something called self-management. So there are some new studies out that show that we can learn skills to monitor and tailor how we deal with fatigue in our life. For example, uh, you can keep a fatigue diary. So you write down when, what activities specifically as you go through your day really affect your fatigue. Because it, you know, it turns out for myself even, I can't remember um, many things that happened even yesterday. So keeping a diary can help us track um, a little bit more carefully where fatigue is really affecting us. Uh, other things that are part of the self-management strategy are priority identification or just basically goal setting. Where, what, what, do I, what am I not doing because of my fatigue that I really wanna be able to do? A third part of self-management that I think is really interesting is called role playing. Um, and so we've heard of this, right? But the idea is we need to learn how to ask for help or assistance. We need to learn how to reduce our barriers and that may affect our fatigue. And so role playing to know how to do that 
um, in situations that might help you um, is all part of this self-management strategy. Uh, another common um, strategy that an occupational therapy, uh, a therapist would give was energy conservation. So this is based on the idea that we all have kind of a certain amount of energy each day. You might picture a glass full of water, and there's lots of ways to drink the water. You could just down it in one gulp, right? Which would be a, a you know maybe similar to doing all of your activity at once in a day, or you could take little sips, or you could take a little bit at each meal. And so maybe um, fatigue management deals with this idea that, um, or energy conservation deals with this idea that we know we all have a certain amount of energy, and we can choose how we spend that each day with little things like sitting while you're doing activities that might you might have done before standing. Now you can do them sitting, and so you're using less energy. Um, planning rests within your day, uh, organizing your workspace, um, your even your desk workspace. You know, we all are in this virtual world right now, right? So it, just addressing how tall your desk is compared to your chair and how your, your computer fits on there and, and how this might affect um, your energy. So we know that if you hold your shoulders up like this while you're on your computer, this is much more energy consuming than if you have your shoulders relaxed. Uh, so again, I feel like rehabilitation is really just this science of, of common sense, but, but we're trying to use science to, to really validate the specific elements that are critical. And in fatigue, this has really been, um, we've, we've gone, you know, there are lots of studies looking at different interventions. The last couple that I want to mention are um, muscle relaxation techniques that I think are really helpful um, to address fatigue and address sleep quality as well. Meditation and breathing techniques. And all of these can be done at home. There are um, professionals that can help um, to learn strategies of how to do this. And, or you can even follow there are YouTube um, videos that can teach you basic ideas on how to address, um, how to do muscle relaxation, for example. So I, I guess my message really is rehabilitation for fatigue has got to be optimized to each person. So we really, all of these, I wouldn't recommend using all of these strategies, but identifying one and trying it and seeing if that helps. And then if that doesn't help, maybe you can move to another. We heard from Tammy who said that she has made the lifestyle changes that her doctor recommended to help with her fatigue. And Tammy's also on medication for fatigue. Now, both the lifestyle changes and the medication have helped, but not very much. Tammy's wondering whether seeing an occupational therapist or a physical therapist might be her next step, and which one would be best to see. So, Dr. Zakowski, when should someone see an occupational therapist or a physical therapist for their fatigue, and which one do they see? That's a really good question. I think. Um you know, seeing a rehabilitation professional, I guess my biggest motivation to recommend this to someone is that an OT and a PT are trained to evaluate and look for really subtle changes or differences that might that you might not notice yourself, or you just need an outside person to observe as you're doing activities. So an occupational therapist um, would really help um, teach you how to adapt activities so that you can enjoy the high priority activities you want to do. Um, that an occupational therapist can evaluate your home, um, either by visiting your home and looking for um, barriers or issues that might be affecting your fatigue, or even virtually, if you can share pictures of how your home is set up. Um, as I was mentioning with the computer and desk setup, the same thing goes for how your bed is set up and how your bathroom is set up and how your kitchen is set up. Uh, also, an occupational therapist can evaluate and, and suggest tools or devices that might be helpful to you at home or at your job or you know wherever the fatigue is really affecting you most. Now physical therapists, um, OTs and PTs work together quite a bit, but, an, uh, but they have very distinct um, degrees. So physical therapists really will help you learn if there are biomechanical challenges that you have or the form of the way you're moving might be contributing to your fatigue. Um, they can help you with your mobility. So they can evaluate your mobility and recommend um, tools or devices that might help you walk um, in, in a way that's less energy consuming. Um, and, and they also can recommend an exercise program that might really fit with your um, particular abilities. So, so I, I really, I, I think seeing a rehabilitation professional has a lot of benefits. 
it might be that you just see them for an evaluation and then you can fulfill more at home. Um, but I really recommend um, uh, seeing one if, if, you know, if, especially if you're at your wits end of what else can I do? I think there are, there are some very important uh, interventions that OTs or PTs can offer. Dr. Norbach, you pointed out that medications to manage MS-related fatigue may not in fact deliver much benefit. What considerations should someone keep in mind when weighing the benefits and risks of adding one of these medications to their regimen? Um, thank you so much uh, for this question. Uh, as I mentioned um, before, and you summarized it really, really well, um, as opposed to uh, interventions such as exercise and cognitive behavior therapy that we do have studies showing they benefit patients with MS and fatigue. Uh, unfortunately, medication that we currently use do not seem to provide much benefit. Uh, and they may actually cause adverse events that uh, are bothersome, such as, as I said, anxiety, headache, uh, even high blood pressure, uh, can happen with medication that we commonly use without uh, providing much benefit. So um, the consideration of um, uh, benefits and risks, which is basically perhaps number one uh, consideration in, in, in medicine uh, that applies here. If we know we do not have something that is uh, that can work consistently and may cause a, some side effects, I generally tend to think twice before, before using that medication. Having said that, uh, in the literature, there are reports of, again, not very high quality studies I'm talking here, but um, uh, when we are looking at using something, we, we have to consider the, the, the downside things that may not have much downside. For example, uh, vitamin B12, you know, there have been um, very low quality studies looking at B12 uh, in different condition and proposing that it may increase energy and improve fatigue. Uh, would I hesitate uh, prescribing that or recommending that? Not really, because there is no known side effect associated with uh, moderate use of uh, a supplement like B12. Or th there is another supplement much more widely recognized in the MS community, and that's vitamin D. Vitamin D that we usually take, everyone with MS, we, almost everyone with MS, we usually recommend to take for possible, even disease modifying benefits. You know, there are some studies, granted, they are not high quality, they are not randomized controlled trials, uh, double blind controlled trials, but they have mentioned that uh, vitamin D supplementation may, may improve fatigue. And again, at moderate doses, as at uh, small doses, vitamin D uh, does not have um, major issues. So do I recommend that to almost all my patients? Uh, you bet, I do. Uh, but other medications that we talked about, like amphetamine-like stimulants uh, with uh, potentially, potentially dangerous side effects, um, I, I, I basically have been thinking twice uh, or three times or more before recomm re recommending them. Before we answer more of your questions, I want to welcome those of you who have continued to join us on GoToWebinar, Facebook Live, and YouTube Live. Please let us know what's on your mind. Post your comments and questions on Facebook and YouTube, or type them into the question box if you joined us on GoToWebinar. Our Ask an MS Expert live event takes place at this same time every Friday. So please help us make sure that everyone knows about it by sharing news about the webcast with your family and your friends. We know that fatigue can have a serious impact on someone's performance at work. We've heard from Jonathan, who said it's been about a year since he had a bad exacerbation, which left him weaker in his legs and more easily fatigued. He's tripping a lot, and getting very tired every afternoon. Jonathan's tried to maintain an active lifestyle, but things seem to be getting worse, not better. And now his boss has pointed out that his performance seems to decline in the afternoons. And Jonathan's really concerned about his job. 
Dr. Zakowski, Jonathan has a lot going on. Where would you start with your assessment? Um, I would again start with a conversation asking about priority areas and we would write them down and try to really um, figure out which ones are the most important to him. <clears throat> um, I would recommend that he has um, his mobility evaluated. Um, there are ways to decre decrease how much energy it takes to walk and we don't want to waste the energy that you have if you can use a device like a cane for example or um, or other a, a walker um, at certain times even in the day just when you're doing a lot of walking at work for example that might be something in the short term that can be done um, i would ask about sleep um, what is your sleep quality like how much sleep are you getting are you feeling emotionally drained um, is there um, you know, how much anxiety is, is the, the work problems, how much is anxiety is that causing you? I would really make an effort to evaluate his physical work environment. Um, are, there, are there possibilities to sit down when you're, where you're working? Are there ways to modify the tasks you do each day? Um, can we address, maybe we need to prioritize the type of work that you do, so the harder cognitive tasks are done earlier in the day and, um, and you kind of reserve the simpler tasks for later in the day when you know your fatigue is affecting you more. Um, I, I really, I think my evaluation would really focus on what can we do now in the short term to address this because it's kind of like a vicious circle, right? So you are fatigued and every day that fatigue meets you at the door and, and it never seems to get any better. And so then you start anticipating that. And so now you're anticipating that you're gonna be very fatigued and it's just very draining. So if we can address some little things in the short term, Maybe we can stop some of that negative thinking and, and then plan for bigger long-term changes. Um, that, like behavior changes really take time to learn and be able to address. And so I, I think that's how I would address things and sort of focusing on short-term and long-term. Dr. Dorbach, Jonathan hasn't recovered completely from the relapse he had a year ago. Can fatigue be a symptom of a relapse? Uh, so actually, Jonathan's case is is a good example to distinguish fatigue from another related uh, condition that I would call, or as as it's called in uh, the literature, as fatigability. So fatigue, as we talked talked about, is a subjective sense of lack of energy, but fatigability is a decline in performance with uh, during a task so uh, as you mentioned uh, jonathan uh, during the day doing during uh, when he's at work when he walks or when he does some cognitive task he his performance declines later during the day okay so that might be actually what we refer to as fatigability and that's most likely a residual symptom of uh, his relapse, unfortunately. Uh, however, it may overlap to some extent with the subjective feeling of lack of energy. So uh, if we just go back to the drawing board, just fatigue as subject as a subjective feeling of lack of energy is not considered a symptom of uh, as a relapse symptom. Relapse symptoms of MS are basically neurological symptoms that happen relatively acutely or subacutely, you know, over a day or two or, or a week, and they worsen generally over uh, days or weeks, and they generally subside either completely or to some extent. You know, we are all familiar with blurred vision from optic neuritis or double vision from involvement of the brain stem or uh, uh, numbness and tingling from the involvement of the spinal cord, but just uh, having fatigue by itself, that subjective lack of uh, uh, energy is not generally considered a symptom of a relapse. Uh, along with uh, what Dr. Zakowski mentioned, uh, the other thing that I would probably want to make sure is addressed in, uh, in the case of Jonathan, is making making sure that his this is modifying therapy is optimized and hopefully we can prevent any other relapse that can lead to uh, this degree of problem and disability 
Well, we've covered an awful lot of information today. So I'd like to ask each of you to share the top three takeaway messages you'd like our audience to keep in mind. Dr. Zakowski, I'll start with you. Okay, this was hard. I, I, I have thought about, you know, if I had to give three pieces of advice, what would I say? So my first one is really to keep in mind that fatigue is treatable and professionals are, are there and trained to help you. So reach out, ask for help. Um, if you don't know where to go, ask one person and then ask for their recommendation of where else you can go. Um, my second is to sit down and prioritize how you think fatigue is most affecting you. What activity is the biggest limitation? Is it physical fatigue? Is it mental fatigue or cognitive fatigue? Or is it the emotional fatigue that really gets to you? Um, and are there moderators that you can address right now related to those, like sleep or motivation or medications? Um, that's, my, that's all my second one. <laughs> so sit down and prioritize what, how fatigue is affecting you. And my third is, I really encourage you to learn about um, a, a, one of the interventions that we mentioned. So meditation or deep breathing exercises or mindfulness-based practices, learn about them and then see if you can try them and see if some new intervention might be the important element. I, I, I think that um, when someone tells me that they've been stretching, you know, I've been stretching caffeine, it's not made any difference. It, it often turns out that they're just not doing the right stretch to get to, to get to the problem that they have. So that's a sort of a muscle analogy, but same with fatigue. It might be that you just haven't tried the right intervention for you. And so keep looking because I think there are a lot of um, opportunities. Dr. Norbach, uh, what are your three top takeaways? Sure, so my number one um, is actually what Dr. Zakowski already mentioned. Ask your healthcare professional. It's very interesting just trying to address the symptom of fatigue. It's been shown that that just just the mere fact of discussing it, measuring it, addressing it, it can improve fatigue. It's it's very interesting. We we saw that in our our, our study that just the patient coming to discuss the fatigue and uh, the possibility of participating even before starting any intervention. The, the second time we measured fatigue, uh, the severity had reduced, not a whole lot, but was better than the first time. So just the mere fact of asking and addressing the symptom is important. Uh, the second um, point is, uh, again, making sure there is no secondary cause uh, that is easily addressable. Medications that we talked about, uh, other issues that come with MS like bladder dysfunction, like uh, and other health conditions like anemia, hypothyroidism, diabetes, these other things that can uh, more easily be addressed. Uh, I cannot overemphasize uh, how their treatment can 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 help with the patient. And the third number is uh, I can't overemphasize the importance of research. We talked about there is no way we do not have a crystal ball to to find out a cure or a treatment for. Uh, MS or MS symptoms. It's impossible to find treatments, it's, it's impossible to find cures without the participation of patients with MS. And uh, I cannot thank enough uh, patients who participated in our uh, research trial and our trials in our um, studies. So uh, please ask your neurologist, please ask your uh, rehabilitation specialist if they know uh, any research studies addressing fatigue and, and advocate for that. And um, uh, without your participation, without uh, your advocacy, uh, there is no way that we would know and understand more about uh, this very common and this very disabling symptom of MS. Well, I would just like to take a moment to thank all of you who have submitted your questions and thank you, Dr. Zakowski and Dr. Norbach for being with us today and sharing some great information on how people can best manage their MS-related fatigue. I think that one of the best things that anyone can do for themselves, especially during these uncertain times, is to make sure that the information they're getting is credible and reliable. So we'd like to share some resources with you. And these are resources you can count on to be both current and credible. I want to remind you that if we were unable to get to your question today, 
The National MS Society's MS Navigator team is your best partner in answering your questions and connecting you to the very best information and resources. It's also worth mentioning that health insurance open enrollment season has begun and Medicare open enrollment runs through December the 7th. MS Navigators want you to know that they have a lot of great resources and tools for anyone looking at their 2021 health insurance options. There's even a special team that's setting up appointments for Medicare beneficiaries during open enrollment to help ensure that your 2021 coverage is what you need it to be. You can contact an MS Navigator by phone, email, or by live chat through the MS Society's website. And for more information and resources on living well with MS by managing MS-related fatigue, please go to the Society's website at nationalmssociety.org and search fatigue. I'd also like to acknowledge that we're in the midst of an emotionally difficult time for so many people, and I want to make sure that you're aware that the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They offer free and confidential support for people in distress, as well as suicide prevention and crisis resources for you or your loved ones. And you can reach them by calling 1-800-273-TALK. That's 800-273-8255. Every week on the Real Talk MS podcast, I continue the conversation that we start here. So I hope you'll take a few minutes and give Real Talk MS a listen. You'll find the Real Talk MS podcast at realtalkms.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, or wherever you find your favorite podcasts. With vital funding from supporters like you, the National MS Society will work to ensure that resources and programs like today's are available and that the MS research community rebounds quickly from COVID-19 so the progress and momentum toward finding a cure continues. As you're able, please make a donation to the Society's COVID-19 Response Fund by texting the word GIVE to 68686, and you'll get a link right to the MS Society's COVID-19 Response Fund webpage. I hope you'll consider making that contribution today. You can connect with the National MS Society on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. And please make sure that you're on the Society's mailing list so you'll continue to receive the latest information on MS research and updates on upcoming programs like this one. I'd once again like to thank Dr. Bardia Norbach and Dr. Kathy Zakowski for joining us today. And I'd like to thank everyone who's joined us for your great questions. Please remember that a recording of this webinar is going to be available for your review on the Society's website at nationalmssociety.org slash msexpert. And now I have a favor to ask each of you. Getting your feedback on today's webcast is important. So you'll see a survey pop up in a moment when we close out the webinar. And if you're watching on Facebook Live, You'll see a link to that survey pinned to the comments section. And on YouTube, you'll find that link in the program description. Completing the survey makes a real difference. The information you provide helps us continuously improve, and it helps shape future webcasts. The survey takes just one minute. So I hope you'll take a minute and please fill it out. Thanks again to Janssen for their sponsorship support and for helping the society make programs like this one possible for our MS community. On behalf of Dr. Bardia Norbach and Dr. Kathy Zakowski, along with the National MS Society, I wanna thank you once again for joining us. Please stay safe and make healthy choices. <music>